Okay, we've we've talked uh, in our previous lecture just in a high-level overview of defects in crystals. Uh, in this particular lecture, we want to drill down and talk specifically about point defects. And, and actually, we're going to talk specifically here about vacancies. So let me define first what a point defect is. All a point defect is is an irregularity in one or two atoms in the crystal structure. Now, uh, there's three primary types of what are of point defects. The first are called vacancies, um, and all we'll talk about what that is. But you can see it's just an atom that's missing uh, from from its uh, spot. The second are called uh, interstitials. And what that means is, as you can see in this picture, here's my atomic structure, and these orange atoms would be interstitials. They're atoms that are that are crammed into spaces not where uh, atoms in the lattice normally reside. And the final uh, category of point defects are called substitutionals. And substitutionals is where an atom replaces another atom uh, in the crystal structure. So um, you, you get something that looks like this. So these are actually very common. And in fact, in metals, that's how we get alloys. Um, OK, so we're going to not talk about uh, interstitials and substitutionals in this lecture. We'll save that for the next lecture. Uh, we're going to focus on vacancies. And then some of the concepts that we cover here, uh, we can apply to those other, other um, point defects. OK, so what is a vacancy? It's a missing atom in a crystal structure. Uh, and so here, here's the blow up of that, that picture I showed you. So what we did was we took an atom out, plop, and we removed it. But we didn't just pull it out of the system. Presumably, it, we, we added it somewhere else. So you can imagine in a large system, uh, if we had a bunch of vacancies, maybe we would create a whole other layer of atoms. And so the material would actually grow uh, or appear to grow. Um, and so the other thing that's important to note is that when we have a vacancy, the lattice planes get distorted because the bonding changes, right? So uh, that that that's going to have an effect on our energy, right? So we know that uh, if if our atoms are not optimally bonded for whatever the structure is, that increases the energy, right? So we expect that the energy of the atoms in this neighborhood of the vacancy to be increased, and they are. And so what that means is that uh, the vacancies by adding them, we increase the enthalpy of the system, right? So remember, enthalpy was that delta H term in the Gibbs free energy, right? So so here's the enthalpy term, right? Which contained all of the, the bond energy potential information. So if the atoms are ideally bonded, which they're clearly not, the bond potential energy increases. So delta H increases with the number of vacancies. Now the question is, in terms of how um, vacancies affect the thermodynamics of the system, how do vacancies affect entropy? Well, let, let's try to answer that, but I need to introduce maybe a little bit more about entropy than you covered in your uh, introductory thermodynamics class. So uh, we're going to talk about configurational entropy. So I know that um, you've typically learned that entropy is sort of a measure of disorder in the system, but that's not actually true. Um, it, in, in the case of uh, crystal structures like this, uh, it's in part, it's a measure of how many, um, they're called degenerate states, but how many states with the same energy exist. And the higher the number of states that have the same energy, uh, the higher the entropy is. Okay? And so we, def and again, I'm not proving any of this, I'm just telling you this, uh, so I'm presenting it. If you wanna, if you wanna, uh, dig deeply uh, into this idea, uh, you, you need to take a statistical thermodynamics class uh, or a statistical mechanics class to see this. But the idea is that the configurational entropy is related to the Boltzmann constant Kb times the natural log of W, which is the number of uh, states with equal energy. Okay, So Kb is the Boltzmann's constant, and W is the number of possible configurations with the same energy. So if that sounds confusing, let's try to apply it to vacancies and see if that clears it up. So here's our example with vacancies. If we have no vacancies, right? Uh, there's only one possible configuration. It looks just like that. Like we can't, there's nothing we can do to change that. And so W equals one. There's actually no entropy in that system. Now let's just add one vacancy. Okay, if I add one vacancy, I'm showing you two examples of adding one vacancy. I could pull a vacancy out here. I could pull a vacancy out here. But basically I could replace any atom in this 36 atom 
array with a vacancy, right? And that would give me a new configuration with the same energy. Uh, and I'm, I'm making the assumption that I'm, I'm ignoring the fact that surface atoms have higher energies, etc. This is just for the sake of argument. So in that case, adding a vacancy, now I have 36 possible configurations with equal uh, energy, which now increases, I, I go from a zero entropy state to some finite entropy state. And in point of fact, if we have uh, some NV vacancies with NA possible sites, we can write um, the the number of possible configurations as the uh, this number of sites factorial divided by the number of vacancies factorial times uh, the sites minus the vacancies, that quantity factorial. You don't have to memorize that. But what's the idea behind all of this is that adding a vacancy to a perfect crystal always increases the entropy, okay? So that means that delta S is gonna be greater than zero um, as we move from a, a, a perfect crystal to a crystal with vacancies, okay? Okay, so we review. So adding a vacancy to a perfect crystal means that I increase the enthalpy. That was pretty easy, right? Because we, we don't have ideal bonding. But if I were to plot that equation that I showed you with all the factorial terms uh, for the same 36 uh, atom uh, configuration, you don't, don't worry about the numbers exactly. Just note that this is a vacancy concentration on the x-axis and the entropy on the y-axis. And the, the curve is quite steep early on and it gets less and less and less. And finally, at about this location, uh, the, the, by adding vacancies, increasing the concentration, I don't increase the entropy anymore. Okay, so in this case, uh, anything that I do in this region, if I increase the vacancy concentration, I'm going to increase the ent entropy, which means that uh, if I have a perfect crystal, I'm always going to increase the entropy. So delta H is greater than zero and delta S is greater than zero. And the magnitude of delta S, uh, the, the, the magnitude of the change is going to decrease, right? It starts out steep and slowly decreases until it gets to no change, and then it actually gets uh, the delta S um, is such that it goes less than zero, right? So that's that's kind of an important uh, foundation to go off of, okay? So what does it mean? It means that uh, it can be shown that the entropic driving force, that means the, the part of the, the driving force related to the entropy for creating a vacancy is infinite, okay? Um, so if we have a perfect crystal and we add one, there's the driving force to bring in a vacancy is is effectively infinite. So anytime we add the vacancy, it's going to reduce the Gibbs free energy. Okay, so right, we have this equation for Gibbs free energy, the change in it, and we said that uh, uh, the the reaction occurs spontaneously if delta G is less than zero. And what I'm telling you is that anytime we have we're we're at a um, finite temperature, so T is not equal to zero, this delta S term will dominate uh, in, in the case of a perfect crystal, okay? What does that mean? That means that vacancies are actually equilibrium defects. So if you have a perfect crystal, it's not actually in equilibrium. It might be in the lowest enthalpy state, but it's not in the lowest, um, uh, it, it doesn't have the lowest Gibbs free energy, which is the, which is the the relevant quantity for defining equilibrium. And so therefore it's not an equilibrium unless there are vacancies, okay? So that's kind of a, a fundamental concept that vacancies have to be in a material and they're always in a material, okay? The other, the, the, the corollary to that is that um, at some concentration, we just showed in the previous slide that, uh, uh, that the, the, the effect of entropy changes as the concentration increases. So at some point, the enthalpic contribution to lowering the Gibbs free energy and the entropic contribution to raising the Gibbs free energy are gonna balance out and we get an equilibrium value. Now I'm giving you this value here, uh, this equation for calculating it. So the vacancy concentration N sub, N sub V, little n sub V, is, gonna, is just the number of vacancies, the total number divided by the total number of sites. And it's equal to this quantity E to the negative Q over KT, where this K sub B, that's the Boltzmann constant, and I'm giving you the values uh, for it here in, in two different units. T is our absolute temperature, and Q is an activation energy. If you remember back to the previous lecture where I showed you that going from state one to state two required us to overcome an energy barrier, that energy barrier is the activation energy. You can think of it as the energy that we need uh, to form a vacancy, okay?
So, um, and if we look at the equation for Gibbs free energy, it shouldn't surprise us that the equilibrium concentration depends on temperature because we know that as we increase the temperature, we increase the contribution of the entropy to the equilibrium of the system. Okay? And so that's why we have uh, um, this temperature dependence in, in this equation. This equation is going to come about um, uh, frequently in this class. It's referred to as an Arrhenius form. I'm going to come back to that again, so you, know, you don't have to um, uh, jot that down this moment. But, I, but this form, E to the negative some activation energy over KT, is, is a critical component to this. Now, let me try to explain uh, this. You don't have to um, uh, be, you're going to be tested on this. But I want to explain what this term means, OK? so. Uh, the the quantity, the exponent e to the negative q sub v over kbt, what that represents is the likelihood that the energy, uh, the, the random thermal energy at some temperature t will, will allow you to overcome this activation barrier. So this quantity is actually a probability, uh, is, is how you should think of it. It's the probability that at any given temperature I'm going to jump over to the new state, okay? So you might wonder, how do we measure this? So that's what we're going to talk about next. How do we measure the activation energy? Or sometimes you'll have, have it re referred to as the vacancy formation energy. So it can be measured by observing how the equilibrium vacancy changes with temperature. So if we have a curve, this is our uh, equilibrium concentration. And it's going to go up with temperature, right? Why? Because increasing the concentration um, is going to increase our entropy. and T is going to control how much the entropy contributes to our uh, equilibrium of the, it, with respect to the Gibbs free energy. So we have this, we measure this, this quantity. But what we can see from this equation, this is the equation I just showed you last uh, slide, is that if we take the log of both sides, it just becomes a linear equation, right? So we replot it, uh, taking the log of um, the, the vacancy concentration and plotting it versus 1 over the temperature. And then we can just read off the slope. Uh, K is a constant, and we can compute QV just from the slope, right? That would be the, the vacancy formation energy. Now, when I'm in, in person, the question frequently comes up, how do we measure um, defect concentration? Well, let me, let me give you one more piece of the, of the puzzle that I think you probably um, intuitively know, but maybe you hadn't thought of specifically, and that's that adding vacancies makes the material expand, right? If I, let me just throw it out. If I, if I have 100 atoms in a, in a line and I add one vacancy into that line, I'm going to increase the, the, the length of that line by 1%, right? Now, usually our vacancy concentrations are less than that, but, but the idea is that it does make a material expand. And so the increase in the vacancy concentration contributes uh, to observe thermal expansion. So now, now, at least as far as this class is concerned, we've talked about two reasons for thermal expansion. One was the asymmetry in the bond potential, right? That, that the actual atom distances grow. But also now you know of a second reason that we get um, thermal expansion, which is the increase in the vacancy concentration. So we can measure the other one via x-ray diffraction. We, we haven't talked about measuring bond length with x-rays, but we can. So we can measure how the bond length changes, and we can subtract off the, the thermal expansion contribution from the, the bond length ex uh, uh, component and, and leaving only the... Um, the component that's due to the vacancies, and we can that's how we get this curve of how the vacancies change with uh, temperature. Okay, so that's sort of the thermodynamics of uh, vacancies, but the, the same ideas uh, with respect to configurational entropy and things like that can also be applied to alloys, uh, both of the interstitial type and the substitutional. So that's going to be the topic of our next lecture.